Don Staley and the South Carolina Gamecocks were named the number one overall seed on Sunday night. And when looking at their path to the Final Four, well, it's quite an easy one. You are Locked On Gamecocks, your daily podcast on the South Carolina Gamecocks. Part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. Hello, Gamecock Nation, and welcome back to the Locked On Gamecocks podcast, your show for the latest headlines and potential storylines on South Carolina Gamecock athletics. I'm Andrew Lyon, the host of this podcast, and also the lead staff writer for Gamecocks Digest over on SI.com. Thank you for making Locked On Gamecocks your first listen or watch here today. We are free and available on YouTube and wherever you get your audio podcasts daily. It was a big day on Sunday for Don Staley and the South Carolina Gamecocks as they found out from the selection committee that they are the number one overall seed in the 2023 NCAA Women's Basketball Tournament. This means that South Carolina effectively is going to have four games within their own state borders as the first two rounds obviously will be played in Columbia at South Carolina, and then should they make it to the Sweet 16 and the Elite 8, which everyone pretty much expects at this point, they will be playing up in Greenville. And when looking at South Carolina's regional as a whole, they have an easy path to the Final Four because when you look at these other top four seeds in Greenville Regional 1, In the two-seeded Maryland Terrapins, the three-seed in the Notre Dame Fighting Irish, and the four-seed in the UCLA Bruins. There's multiple reasons why every single one of these teams, either from an experience or from a personnel or coaching standpoint, do not match up against the South Carolina Gamecocks. Let's start off with the UCLA Bruins who was a team that admittedly gave South Carolina one of their toughest tests during the regular season. Obviously, that was all the way back in, I believe, late November, early December, so we're talking a few months ago at this point, but nonetheless, a familiar foe for Don Staley and the Gamecocks. Here's the thing, though. UCLA, for as good of a season as they've had, they have a lack of of experience making deep tournament runs. Head coach Corey Close has made it to the NCAA tournament seven times in her career. But in terms of making it past the Sweet 16, which is where the Bruins would meet the Gamecocks in a hypothetical scenario, she's only made it past that round one time in those seven tries. Don Staley, for comparison's sake, has made it past the Sweet 16 five times in her career. So in terms of the coaching experience in that type of situation, you would have to give a pretty big edge to Don Staley and her staff. The UCLA Bruins also would be facing a South Carolina team that has adjusted well in their second matchup against respective opponents this season. When talking about opponents that the Gamecocks have faced twice this season, let's start off with Ole Miss. The first time around, it was an ugly matchup for the Gamecocks. They only won by seven points, and they had to go to overtime to knock off the Rebels in Oxford. But not long after that matchup, they met them once again in the SEC tournament. South Carolina won by 29 points the second time around. The Gamecocks also played the Tennessee Volunteers in their second-to-last regular season matchup, playing them in Knoxville and only winning by 13 points. They faced the Volunteers in the SEC Tournament Final, and they beat Tennessee by 16 points, just marginally better. But either way, the game was never really in question after sort of the first 15 minutes or so. So you have to imagine with how they've been playing recently against opponents that they've seen before that South Carolina would adjust to what they might have done incorrectly the first time around against the UCLA Bruins that led to the game being such a close affair. Now, let's move on to the three seed in the Notre Dame Fighting Irish. The Fighting Irish might be 
a fool's gold team. Because six of the Fighting Irish's regular season wins this season were by six points or less. Now, admittedly, this is a sort of double-edged sword type of statement. You could say that this means that the Irish have come up big in crunch time, but you could also take this fact and say that they've made too many mistakes to where they've had issues putting teams away. Obviously, it's very hard to tell because I'm sure that probably none of us have really watched a lot of Notre Dame women's basketball up to this point in the season. Here's something, though, that cannot be denied. Niall Ivey, the head coach of the Notre Dame women's basketball program, is extremely green as a head coach when it comes to her overall experience and including her postseason experience. She's only coached at South Bend for the last three years since Buffy McGraw stepped down just a couple of years ago. And that includes this year as well. Ivy made it to the Sweet 16 with the Fighting Irish this past NCAA tournament, but they did not make it beyond that round. So again, another coaching advantage here for South Carolina in terms of the experience that Dawn Staley and her staff bring to the table. And here's the other thing. Notre Dame is going to be awaiting the news on superstar Olivia Miles, one of their best players, if not their best player on the entire team, who is questionable to play in the tournament after suffering a freakish injury in the ACC tournament. And then this to say, if you want to beat South Carolina, you got to have some star players that really shine on the hardwood. And if Notre Dame does not have Olivia Miles with them, if they were to face South Carolina in a hypothetical matchup, then there's just no shot of Notre Dame potentially upsetting the South Carolina Gamecocks here. And then the last team we'll talk about real quickly is the two-seed Maryland Terrapins. Like I mentioned earlier with the UCLA Bruins, the Gamecocks have faced the Terrapins before, so they are another familiar opponent to them. And here's the thing. The Gamecocks smoked the Terrapins the first time around that they played them, defeating them 81-56 to on November the 11th. And they did this up in College Park. Now, some people would point out that the Terrapins didn't have star player Diamond Miller on the floor for that game. And considering Diamond Miller's impact for the Maryland Terrapins, that would be a fair point to make. But here's the thing. It would have been a lot to ask Diamond Miller to make up a 25-point deficit by herself against South Carolina's defense. The Gamecocks have only allowed a player to reach that scoring mark three individual times this season, and no one has scored more than 25 points against South Carolina's defense. So that's one thing to note with that hypothetical matchup. The other thing is this. Unlike the other two teams that I've already mentioned, Maryland has a very obvious lack of size on their roster. No player on their roster is taller than six foot three inches. And here's the thing. When looking at the stats, it shows up. Maryland gets out rebounded on average by their opponents. And there's no player on the team that averages more than six and a half rebounds a game. So if South Carolina were to meet up with Maryland and say the Elite Eight, which would be the one way that they would play against each other in this regional, South Carolina's front court should basically have a dominating performance automatically because of, again, the overall height and size that they would bring to the floor. So again, when you look at all three of these teams, they've all got flaws and it's hard to find really any flaws with South Carolina's team. But for South Carolina, you've got to love the way that this regional is set up for you. As Don mentioned to ESPN's Courtney Lyle yesterday, you got familiar opponents that are in this bracket and you don't have a team that really and truthfully scares South Carolina. So South Carolina, they got an easy path to the Final Four. And let's just say it would be a real shock if they were to not make it to Dallas at the minimum. Now, of course, 
South Carolina's women's basketball team is going to start their tournament run this upcoming weekend. So we got a lot of time to talk even more about their first round matchup and the matchups that will take place after that as well. But South Carolina's football team's also got a massive week on hand. As obviously they got Pro Day coming up later today and they start spring practice on Tuesday. So it's time for us to finish up sort of our talk on the roster with the defensive backfield. And we're going to do an in-depth dive into that position group in just a few moments right here on Locked On Gamecocks. Today's show is brought to you by Built Bar. The Built March Madness bracket is here. Built Bar has got their own March Madness bracket, but with their own Built Bars and Built Puffs on there. So if you want to make your own bracket, go to www.builtmarchmadness.com to vote for your favorites right now. From my end, I'm going to be picking Cookie Dough Chunk Puffs to go all the way. Cookie Dough Chunk Puffs were my first love over at Built Bar. And just like in real life, your first love, you do not ever forget them. So I'm going to pick Cookie Dough Chunk Puffs to go all the way. And when you vote, you'll be entered into a drawing where 50 lucky locked on listeners will get a free box of Built Bars or puffs and one lucky locked on fan will want a 12 month subscription to built where your favorite bar or puff can be delivered right at your doorstep built bars are jam-packed with protein they're low in sugar and they're covered in real chocolate something that's not a guarantee unfortunately with every protein bar out there on the market so run to www.builtmarchmadness.com right now to vote for your favorite bar or puff and pick up a box while you're there you can vote every day in march so be sure to take advantage of the opportunity to support your favorite bar today Welcome back to this Monday edition of the Lockdown Gamecocks podcast, where we cover your South Carolina Gamecocks every single day. Grab your bracket and go listen to the Lockdown College Basketball Bracket Breakdown. With national analysis and the insights from our local experts, the Lockdown College Basketball Bracket Breakdown has everything you need to make the most informed decisions on your bracket. Find the episode of Lockdown College Basketball wherever you get your podcasts and on YouTube. All right, let's get back to South Carolina's football team as they are getting ready to start spring practice just 24 hours or less from now. And on today's show, we're going to talk about South Carolina's defensive backfield and more specifically, mainly the cornerback position, which for South Carolina is going to give them plenty of options and lineups to tinker with in spring practice and eventually maybe even in fall camp now the collective losses of cam smith and darius rush obviously can't be fully filled because both of these guys were solid cornerbacks for south carolina and there's a reason why the both of them have had a lot of talks surrounding them as potential day one or day two draft picks but There's multiple adequate players who could fill in the void that is being left behind by both of these guys. So let's start off with sort of the main lineup that a lot of people are going to go with with this cornerback group. And that would be the outside corner spots being filled in by Marcella Stahl and O'Donnell Fortune and the nickel corner spot being filled in by DQ Smith. Now, This one is basically sort of, again, a chalk line because Dial and Fortune have both been outside corners for the majority of their career at this point. And they both seem to do a much better job when they are in a more coverage-based position because obviously, if you're going to be playing that nickel spot, you got to be a defensive back that can get after it in rush defense. And that's not to say that Marcellus Dial nor O'Donnell Fortune cannot do that, but In terms of that, compared to their coverage abilities, both of these guys do a better job in terms of being able to just go back with receivers and just go make a play on the ball. So you can't see either one of these guys being moved from those outside corner spots. 
for the nickel corner spot in DQ Smith. If the Gamecocks were to put DQ Smith at the nickel corner spot, they would be effectively putting their biggest defensive back outside of Nick Emmett Worry closer to the line of scrimmage. Plus, it would give David Spaulding, who is recovering still from a surgery that he had in the middle of last season, the chance to be able to go back and play some safety, be able to see really everything that's going on around him on the football field. And plus, he's a veteran guy. This would be his fifth year in college football. So you could also say that David Spaulding could help out Nick Emmett worries significantly in terms of the mental aspect of his game. So there's really truthfully a lot that makes sense when you talk about this potential lineup at those corner slots. Now, let's talk about another lineup option. Let's say that Marcel Stahl and O'Donnell Fortune both stay at outside corner. But instead of DQ Smith being at the nickel corner slot, you have David Spaulding stay at that spot. If you went with this lineup, then the coaching staff would have basically be leaning on the experience factor here because these guys have all made 63 total appearances, including 26 starts in their career at South Carolina. And for the most part, those starts and appearances have come at these exact positions for each of these three guys. So if South Carolina was maybe a little bit more concerned about the receiving cores and quarterbacks that they were facing in the SEC this year, which I don't believe there's really any real reason to be concerned with, but if they were, this would probably be the kind of line that you would see them trot out there, having the most experienced guys right out there on the front lines so that they can maybe best combat anything that ends up happening in the first couple seconds of these plays throughout a football game. And then you've got another lineup option that you could possibly run out there. And this one would be a lot different from the other two and would admittedly be one that could not be tested until fall camp. But let's say South Carolina decides to have Keenan Nelson Jr. and Vakari Swain at outside corner and Marcellus Dial gets moved to that nickel corner slot. This lineup would be what I would call a versatile lineup because the thing is, Keenan Nelson Jr. and Marcel Style have both shown, at least in some aspects in the past here at South Carolina, that they can play both inside corner and outside corner. Keenan Nelson Jr. did this a lot at his high school up in St. Joseph's in Pennsylvania, and Marcel Style, he got some time at that nickel spot this past season whenever Cam Smith was a little bit dinged up and out of the game. So it's not like that Marcel Style couldn't handle the nickel responsibilities at all. The bigger question out of this particular line would probably be if he could handle doing that for 12 games throughout a regular season. If Key Nelson Jr. was ready to step up at an outside corner slot. To be honest with y'all, in this hypothetical lineup option, the guy that I'm probably the most comfortable with is probably Vakari Swain, who I really feel like the more that I sort of think about this as we get closer and closer to spring practice and eventually closer to fall camp, I really feel like Vakari Swain is one of those guys that can make a lot of immediate noise and impact for this team as soon as he arrives on campus. I think that there's a much bigger window of opportunity to nab a starting spot at one of those outside corner slots than what's been let on up to this point. So again, this one is definitely sort of a wild card lineup, but if you want to go with a lineup that you could sort of move guys all over the field, then you would probably put guys out there like Keenan Nelson Jr., Vakari Swain, and Marcellus Dial playing that nickel spot. Now, South Carolina, they also have a really good safety on their roster in Nick Emmonworry. And he is a guy that is going to be expected to step up in a big way this next season. We'll dive further into that conversation in just a couple moments right here on Locked On Gamecocks. Today's show is brought to you by FanDuel. The NBA's regular season is nearing the home stretch, and now is the perfect time to download FanDuel, America's number one sportsbook, because right now, new customers get a no-sweat first bet up to one 
thousand dollars. That's bonus bets back if your first bet doesn't win. The FanDuel Sportsbook app is safe, secure, and super easy to use. And you can bet on everything from the money line to specific prop bets to even making your own same game parlay. So don't miss the chance to get your no sweat first bet up to $1,000 in bonus bets when you go to FanDuel.com slash locked on. That's FanDuel.com slash locked on to learn more. Make every moment more with FanDuel, an official sports betting partner of the NBA. Welcome back to today's edition of the Lockdown Gamecocks Podcast, where we cover your team every single day in just 30 minutes. South Carolina's Nick Evan Worry playing at the safety position for this defense this upcoming season. He's going to become the guy on their defense this next season. Nick Evan Worry is a guy that led this team in total tackles with 85 This past season, he was named a freshman All-American by multiple different outlets. And he's somebody that's now one of the most experienced players on this defense. Because you think about all the guys that have left the program this offseason. Guys like Zach Pickens, guys like Gilbert Edmond, Jordan Birch, Sherrod Green, Brad Johnson, Darius Rush, Cam Smith. There's a lot of players. Devonnie Reed at the safety spot. There's a ton of vets that were quite productive, that played big roles for this defense a year ago, that are no longer in the building. And so, South Carolina's defensive coaching staff, they're going to be searching for who are going to be the guys that are going to be the leaders now of this unit heading into this upcoming fall. And one of them's got to be Nick Emmon Worry. Now, I will say this. In terms of overall leadership, when we normally think of leaders, we think of people that are basically great communicators, people that can rally everybody around them and make sure that everybody is on the same page and at the same time lead by example. And there's multiple leadership styles that people can sort of take on with their respective role. I think that Nick Evan Worry is going to be one of those guys that's going to lead by example. I definitely think that Part of the reason why he didn't really speak up as much last year when, say, he was at press conferences was because Nick Evan Worry understood that he was a true freshman. He understood that he was a young buck. And I think that he sort of felt like that he did not want to really put himself or any of his teammates in any sort of bad spot based on some sort of comment that he made. And so he was always very careful and meticulous with the media whenever we would ask him questions when he was available to us after a practice or after football games. I think that that's going to somewhat remain the case this year, but I do think that you're going to see Nick Emory open up a little bit more in terms of sort of how things are going on this side of the ball. And I definitely think that you're going to see him, again, take on a bigger and different role with this team because he's now shown that, listen, he can handle SEC play in college football. He's a guy that can be a leader of this team in terms of his production. So... In essence, he's somebody that is going to have to be a guy on this defense in terms of his leadership abilities, and I think that he is going to do just that this season. And then obviously, at that other safety spot, it's all going to depend on what the coaches sort of decide with that nickel corner slot, because it seems like right now that when you look at maybe strong safety or that nickel corner slot, that the coaches are trying to decide between DQ Smith or David Spaulding. And if one guy ends up being put at one spot in the lineup, then the other guy is going to take the other spot automatically. So it's going to be interesting to see how all that plays out as spring practice moves along. But the other thing is this. South Carolina, of course, also is returning some key players on special teams as well. First of all, Pete Limbo is sticking around in Columbia for at least another season. And Gamecock fans ought to appreciate that as much as they can because, admittedly, You know, Pete Limbo has mentioned before that he does want to get a head coaching opportunity once again. And there was a couple programs out there that really tried their best to get him this past offseason. But Pete Limbo decided to stick around. He got a really nice contract extension for that. I believe he's now the highest paid special teams coordinator with no added responsibilities in the entire sport. 
And here's the other thing. He's returning guys like Mitch Jeter and Kai Kroger, two guys that were two of the best players at their position in all college football this past season. Mitch Jeter never missed a field goal attempt. Kai Kroger was arguably the best punter in the country consistently with what he did last fall. Both of these guys are coming back for another year. And here's the other thing. When you talk about special teams units, usually we talk about the kicker and punter positions, and then we sort of stop there. But South Carolina special teams units, they're getting a lot of added depth, a lot of help with this recent recruiting class that they just signed. Think about this. Guys like Xavier McLeod, guys like Grayson Pup Howard, Jalen Kilgore, Zabari Sandy, CJ Adams, Jerron Willis from Ole Miss transferring over to Columbia, and then Nick Elksness, the transfer tight end from Florida. Not every single one of these guys is going to be starting at their positions this upcoming fall. Not every single one of these guys is going to be playing 40, 50 plus snaps a game at their position. So there's going to be some gas left in the tank for them to find other ways to make an impact on this team. And that is special teams for South Carolina. And with what they've done up to this point in Pete Limbo and Shane Beamer's short time here in Columbia, you got to imagine that a lot of these guys are excited about the opportunity to make an impact on special teams, knowing what it could do for them in terms of showing, obviously, more tape to future NFL scouts for what they can offer to their respective team and also be able to make an impact and be able to actually score some points on special teams. It's obviously a very unique brand of football compared to the rest of the programs out there in the college game. But Beamer Ball 2.0 has really taken on a life of its own here at South Carolina. And there's no question that this is going to be a unit that's once again going to make an impact for this team in 2023. Is it a guarantee that they'll be number one once again in terms of special teams efficiency? It's going to be hard to do. It's very difficult to do something like that two years in a row. But if there's any team right now out there that could pull that off, it is probably Pete Limbo, Kai Kroger, Mitch Jeter, and the rest of South Carolina's special team units. But with that being said, y'all, that's going to do it for today's show of the Lockdown Gamecocks podcast. I hope y'all thoroughly enjoyed today's show, as always. What are your thoughts on Don Staley and the South Carolina Gamecocks position in the NCAA tournament? What are your thoughts on their regional? Do you think that they got an easy path all the way to the Final Four? Let me know your thoughts on that and all the other topics I went over on today's show down below in the comments section. If you're watching today's show on YouTube or you can shoot me a direct message on Twitter at a line underscore SC and I'll try to respond to it as quickly as I see it. And once again, don't forget to make Lockdown College Basketball your second listen or watch for your own bracket breakdown now that you have watched or listened to the Lockdown Gamecocks podcast. But once again, that does it for me on today's show. Have a great rest of your Monday and a fantastic start to the work week. And I will catch y'all on the next show of the Lockdown Gamecocks podcast. <laughs>